Okay, Patricia, we do have a quorum. We need you to get a chance to look at the minutes of the previous meeting. Yes, I did. Okay. Any changes, deletions? No. Anything like Looking for a motion then, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No one. Motion's passed, thank you. Now we can get into our discussion. And Tim, do you want to hit us off? Or? Sure. So, um, let's see, I see Chandler, you sent some reports around on uh, Friday afternoon for us to digest over the weekend. So, um, <laughs> just, you know, Chandler, can you send me a copy? Oh, yeah. I sent you one last night, but maybe it didn't go through. It didn't go through. Yeah. We finally got our county mail straightened out, David, and now <laughs> other emails are giving me trouble. Huh? <laughs> um, so, David, uh, I'll look at you for some direction. Should we just allow the teams to report out one by one? Or? I think that, that would be beneficial because I would really like to hear where everyone is at and then that can help us determine exactly what are the next steps needed in order to cre create a hopefully finalized plan by the end of the month. I think we're starting to sneak up on it. Um, you know, I think by, by, by virtue of what I read the reports, everybody is becoming um, more and more uh, aware of economic development uh, of the economic world landscape, let's put that. So challenges, issues, uh, opportunities, how to go about trying to you know, spread our brand, build our brand. Um, I think one of the things that, that um, I'm kind of locked in at this point that um, we haven't addressed yet, but uh, hopefully we'll address it at some point today. I didn't see anything specific in the reports in terms of, of target um, and who we're going to target. I didn't see how we're going to reach people, but it just we need to make sure we're cognizant of you know, who we're trying to reach. So anyway, that said, um, um, who wants to start? Any volunteers? All right, Brenda, you just got elected. <laughs> OK, so I'll first talk about what I individually looked at uh, with how Brantford gets their state funding. And basically what I found out is there is a bipartisan bioscience caucus uh, in the state uh, legislature, which looks at and tries to find uh, places for job growth and investable companies, and then they help them locate into the state. And that's a lot of what Brantford has been utilizing is they find these bioscience companies and then they work with the caucus to get funding and to get kind of that push that they need to get these companies to relocate from the cities into Brantford. Um, another thing that this caucus works with is the, there's a company, it's more of a nonprofit called Bio Connecticut, uh, which is looking to help grow Connecticut's bioscience community. Uh, their main plans are they have leadership in the state Senate uh, they have an incubator and a co-working space in Groton so that people can go there to do their own work. Uh, they look for sponsorships and investments, and then they also do a lot of collaboration and learning space activities, as well as speakers to help um, like bring the knowledge of the bioscience community to more of the community at large to try to make it more of a presence in the state. So you found BioCT. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a very active group. Um, so good research. What you found is uh, is completely accurate. I'm trying to. Did you submit a report? I don't think I did. I can write this up and send it out to you, though. Okay. All right. And, and uh, I just want to get my arms around who are you working with. This was the research I did by myself that I was looking further into from last week. Okay. So when we last we left that last meeting, you, Jack, John, and Shay were gonna work on branding. Right? Yep, I have that report as well. I just wanted to report out on my individual work first so that then we can go into the marketing strategy of my whole team. Okay. All right. So how did how did you come about the information uh, with Brand? Who did you speak to? How did you uh, so I wasn't actually able to speak with anyone. I looked through a lot of the state website into what their reportings have been. Uh, they have a couple of stories about what the caucus has done, uh, who they've worked with within the state legislature. 
and um, the companies that they've helped bring into Brantford and to other regions. Interestingly enough, uh, when Brantford's economic development specialist retired, I would say uh, about a year ago, they didn't replace the position. So, um, which I, I'm not sure, none of us are sure how to, how to take it and interpret that, but nonetheless, they, they have been successful in aligning themselves with New Haven um, in an in a, a organization that is supposed to be uh, representing the entire New Haven region, but a company or a rep, an organization called Rex Development. Um, so, uh, and the shoreline proximity has been very attractive to bioscience because it's very attractive to the employees, the scientists, et cetera, who say they'd like to get to live along the shoreline and the shoreline. So, um, maybe, a, maybe a slight advantage, but we certainly have the facilities and we have the buildings. And we're equidistant, for sure. We're equidistant to Rankford, so. And we have a major highway. As they have 95, we have 91. Just as an example. I guess the, the, um, the question there is, is uh, can we get a bite of that pie? Uh, From the looks of it, it looks like they're trying to bring it to Connecticut at large. So I think we can. I think uh, getting in touch with maybe some of the representatives on the caucus or talking to people at uh, Bio Connecticut uh, to see what they want from like office space or workspaces that we might be able to provide them. Is, is the caucus in the legislature or is it in the town council area? The legislature, the state legislature. The state legislature. Yeah, I have, uh, it looked like it was mostly the state senator, um, Christine Cohen, and then I don't know if the uh, representative I have as the co-chair is accurate, but I had Representative Reed as the co-chair. Representative who? Reed, R-E-E-D. I don't know. Christine, Representative Cohen has been very friendly to economic development around the state of Connecticut, not only for that, but other initiatives, transfer act initiatives. That nature. But she's from Randall, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. And, and just for everybody's edification, we are actively involved with BioCT. So it's, it's, it's called BioCT instead of BioConnecticut, but we've been actively involved with BioCT, um, but we have not been successful in, in breaking through. But, uh, so as we, we formulate our strategies, we need to, we need to obviously send a stronger message as to why Wallingford is a good alternative, because um, we haven't been able to break through that uh, number. So, great research there, bro. Okay. Uh, if we want to go into the marketing strategy plan, we can start at the top of that document, which would be the work that John did, and then we can just go in order of how the document is laid out, so you can follow along a little easier. All right, so the documents that I received don't have anybody's name on them. Um, so which, let's see, is it the one? So this would be the marketing strategy. Um, specific marketing strategies? Yeah. Okay. So you say John's going to start? Yeah, I guess, I don't know if, uh, you didn't get the fully laid out. If you just have the bullet points, it's not in the same exact order as our paper, but it's in pretty much the same order. So you should be able to follow along pretty easily. No, I've got a, I've got a paragraph format. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'll start off. Um, so that first uh, section that we have, it's about how we attract businesses, but this whole document that we created is all about um, attracting businesses, obviously, about getting you know more workforce, looking at um, how to attract younger employees. So this whole document is really about attracting business. Um, something important to note, is that there's a lot of uh, overlap in strategies um, and what we're the goal of is using that strategy. Um, but that's because it's like a two bird, one stone kind of thing. We want to be efficient with the strategies we do have. And so by doing one strategy, we can target multiple goals. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through um, the document. 
So looking at the four primary factors, financial incentives, infrastructure, workforce, and quality of life, we think that making this clear tabs within the um, Wallingford website is a great idea. One, because after my conversation with Jim Burke, he was the economic uh, director um, in Windsor, um, uh, I reviewed their website. It was very organized. They had all the information laid out very well. And so I think having clear information where the person looking to move the businesses and they look at Wallingford, having the information right there and not having to do the digging that I've had to do on other websites, I think is a very key. Um, so moving into each section, um, infrastructure, um, we want to mention and make sure we hammer the point of the commuter lines and access to the highway. Um, but also we think that um, mapping out the infrastructure on like a little infographic, maybe a map, and putting it on the website would be a good idea because it kind of visualizes the infrastructure that we have in Wallingford that the businesses would have access to. Um, so next, uh, about financial incentives. We do a good job on the, on the website currently about talking about the incentives for businesses. Um, and so maybe um, we need to just um, uh, make a more robust list and look at um, those each individually and create more information about them. Uh, so that way the um, person searching doesn't have to look um, at different places to find more information on the incentives. Um, for workforce. John? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. So help me understand uh, more clearly what you mean. So on our website, are you saying that our incentives are too difficult to find? No. So uh, it's easy to find. I just think that we should have a more robust list and more description of the incentives because uh, if you go on the site, you do see the listed um, incentives on there. But I think that talking more in detail about each program directly on the website will help because then the information is right there and it's one less click or one less search that the person has to do in order to find that information. So um, I would agree that what's there is, is it's the incentive. It's legalese. It's... Um, it spells it out. You're saying maybe it may be a narrative that um, reinforces uh, the fact that, you know, um, who we're trying to attract with the incentive. Is that what you're saying? You Some, something like that. Just a larger description than what we have because it's a, it's a nice list and it's good information. But having one less click for the person to have to click on or look at is better because if the information is right there. Then they, then they can do all the research from that tab instead of having to click on each individual link, looking at the program, searching a different website and looking into it. So having like a one-stop shop for all the information that they would need on incentives in that tab. Okay, very good. Thanks, continue. Okay, Same and then uh, the, the, for the workforce, um, we want to create a program, and this is going to be something that you hear throughout our document, but we think it's important that we create uh, programs that links us up with local surrounding colleges and connects them with businesses, either for jobs or internships, because this way businesses will have direct access to not only the workforce in, um, <clears throat> in Wallingford, but access to surrounding younger employees that we're trying to attract as well. Um, and then lastly, for quality of life, again, when I talked to Jim Burke, um, they made it a large priority on their website to focus on quality of life. And they found that a lot of the people looking, like the CEOs and the COOs, um, about moving the business, a large part of it was the quality of life. Um, so we think that we should focus on that, but not solely, because I think that all four of these factors really plays into um, uh, the whole Wallingford persona and what we're trying to do to attract. Something that they did, which was really interesting, is they surveyed uh, all the town employees and asked, what is your favorite thing or favorite part or favorite uh, resource in um, Windsor? And then they compiled that list and were able to make a, um, uh, a nice message to um, the businesses they're trying to attract or the people they're trying to attract. Because if you go directly to the source, and ask the citizens what they like most about the town, you'll find some really interesting things. So I think that's something that we might be able to do. Um, so moving on. Another question. Mm -hmm. um, so are, are you suggesting that by us emphasizing quality of life, you know, more on the website, that that's going to attract more residents or more businesses? 
I think it can, I think it can do both. Um, I think a problem that Windsor has, they solely focused on um, the quality of life and there wasn't enough information on the other factors, but I think having a good balance of all the factors that we're talking about right now is um, well-rounded and gives not only um, a reason for businesses, but a reason for um, employees as well to look at Wallingford and say, wow, this is, look, the, all the information that we need is right here. We can go through and say, yep, this checks off our needs for our businesses, or yep, this checks off the needs for our employees. So I think a well-rounded um, uh, um, information of all of them is important. Thanks. So um, going on to attracting younger employees, we did talk about the connecting the programs connecting to colleges in order to attract younger employees from the from the um, offset. Because if we get a company who gets interns from say uh, say Quinnipiac, then that might result in a job. Or if we get a Quinnipiac student who gets a job in Wallingford, they're most more likely to move there. But it gives us access to younger people from further away. Um, but going along that line, younger people will be the harder ones to attract because um, they want that social life, they want the city. Um, so a smaller town is kind of hard to pitch to them. However, with everything going on from uh, you know COVID to uh, riots to um, everything with that's associated with the city like costs, it's a better, it's easier to do it now than it has been before. So there are a lot of people who are looking to get out of the city who are generally younger. So I think that's something to think about when we're moving forward with younger people. Um, we also okay. want to make sure. Another question, John, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so if as we emphasize quality of life on our website and in um, there's a company that is ringing in my mind right now. Um, you know, he's saying, I don't need just to sell in Wallingford. I need to sell in Wallingford's proximity to bigger cities, New York, Boston, even Hartford, New Haven, because people who want that type of activity, want that type of experience, can do so in Wallingford for half the price. Live in Wallingford, jump on the, the, uh, the Hartford line and go to Hartford, jump on the Hartford line. Plus, it's three bucks. <laughs> To yeah. take a train to New Haven. So, um, so should we should we have on up to our website not only emphasize quality of life in our community but uh, connect it to some regional benefits? Yeah, absolutely. So we talk about this a little bit in the document. Um, you know, young people still want the social life but they don't necessarily want to live in the city. So if we say we have access to the city in order to go, you know, if you want a weekend out to the city, you can do that, but you can still come home to a nice quiet area that has great quality of life. That's not expensive. Um, making that pitch to younger people will definitely be a um, big selling point, I think. Thank you. Uh, yep. Uh, so also in the younger, um, attracting younger employees section, we built a persona uh, named Dave. Um, so we uh, have this persona that would make it easier to target to. So Dave is 22. He's freshly out of college. He doesn't really want to live in a city. So he's looking for places, um, with smaller towns that are better quality of life, um, more quiet, but he needs to make sure that there's opportunities. So we need to make sure there's opportunities for Dave. And we also need to make sure that there's um, ample housing that he is um, aware of. So part of that is we think that we should create a walling for database um, where we compile uh, jobs um, that are in Wallingford, um, reach out to businesses and have try to have updated um, like once per month because I think businesses do a good job on their own, uh, posting on LinkedIn, posting on Indeed, but creating a database for Wallingford that then we can go share and try to spread ourselves as like a one-stop shop for people looking at Wallingford in general might be a good idea and might attract more young people. Um, so for the rebranding, the positives of Wallingford, we think that a big appeal of Wallingford is like the quint quintessential. Oh, sorry. Yep. That's okay. Um, I, I'm sorry to keep stopping, but you're hitting on some really important stuff and I just don't want to blow through it. Okay. Yeah. So but let's let's talk about the jobs database. Um, um, I mean, the way people find jobs today, between you know all the boards that are out there, 
um, everybody's scraping everybody else, and they're you know they're you know, putting jobs together. It's you know I, I've kind of I've kind of become a little bit. I think I think I hear people say, "My God, it's just so complicated to try to find work because whether it's Indeed, whether it's Shop.com, it's CT jobs. I mean, everybody's got a job." And then there's the aggregators that take and, and you know are pulling all that stuff together. So um, I don't know. I just I guess we have to try to understand better how people find jobs. Because you know if we were to set up something in Wallingford as our own database, um, you know, gosh, how do we become credible? Because we're bothered with something that's just there's so many about. Do, do we as a website send them to an aggregate aggregator? So I, th so I think a, I think that most businesses would have a section on their site to post like job postings, um, but they post it on multiple sites like LinkedIn and like Indeed. And so there's a lot of overlap like that. But having a place for Wallingford to um, post jobs that would link to then the, the business's website, I think would be beneficial because if somebody's on um, uh the website looking to, if we're attracting employees and attracting a workforce also looking for quality of life, somebody might see um, the database of jobs on the one for website and go, okay, there are opportunities here. I, I have easy access and easy list to look through all of them. Instead of having to search through the multiple sites, I think that it it's um, not, ne not, not necessarily vital to have, but it's a nice um uh, bonus. It's a nice um, little um, benefit that somebody would have by looking through the website. So, hi. <clears throat> so, yep. creating that database is Wallingford, and then creating that triangle between Indeed, the company, and Wallingford would also increase search engine optimization. Correct. Yeah, uh, having more, uh, having the job posting out there um, more on on uh, Google searches. I think would in it would boost the um, the search engine optimization of it. Um, so I think that's a good point also. Okay. Uh, so to rebrand the pauses of Wallingford, part of the, the big appeal is the quintessential New England feel because there's a small town in New England. Uh, it has a good uh, community feel and a good, um, you know, nothing better than New England season changes and stuff like that. So we want to kind of make sure that people are seeing that part of Wallingford. Um, I think that it was uh, John who searched Wallingford into the Google images and saw not a whole lot going on there. And we want to make sure that Wallingford looks appealing and looks nice to live in. So um, part of that was maybe creating a, um, <clears throat> creating a, um, contest within the town for the uh, citizens to partake in where every season we have a contest for people to share photos on the Facebook for, uh, Facebook page um, and uh, Wallingford would go through and maybe post it as the company's um, site page. But this way, we're getting a lot of photos out there and we can make a hashtag, say Wallingford photo contest like fall 2020, and it gets more images of Wallingford out there that are, you know, I think people can actually take pretty good photos and put them out there instead of the photos that exist in Wallingford, which are kind of more bland, more standard, just kind of look at um, the town. But if we get good quality photos out there from the masses, it's good user generated content to put out there and make it more appealing for the town. Um, we want to make sure that we really hammer the point of the quality of life. And I think that um, doing so, we can also get some QU students in here to create um, uh, videos um, for uh, Wallingford. The one that we have on the site right now, it's good. I think it's from 2018, um, but it's kind of choppy. It's kind of, it's not the smoothest. It does use drone shots, but I think that it could be better. And some of the QU students here, I, I know personally do um, drone work and stuff like that, that are really good. And so um, we want Wallingford to, uh, look good in the content they produce, but also you know, if we're promoting ourselves as a STEM community, we want to make sure that we're using all the updated um, uh, equipment and, and look good. Um, so I think getting a QU student in here to remake videos or create a bunch of videos, a series of videos um, would be a good idea. 
Um, as for some of the downsides, um, some of the people in my group had talked to brokers um, that um, pitch Wallingford and they didn't have a lot of bad things to say about Wallingford, which is great news. So I think that um, we need to make sure that we keep developing quality relationships with brokers. Um, and for the ones that we don't know, sending out pamphlets um, that profile Wallingford um, or like a, a 360 view of everything that we're doing now and sending them out to um, brokers to say, wow, this town looks pretty good because we say we have the cheapest um, electricity in New England, like right on the front page, that's going to get their attention. So just making sure that we stay um, uh, focused on brokers, because that's a big part of um, attracting people and attracting businesses to Wallingford. John, I just wanted to go back to what you had said, this, this character that you created, Dave, yeah. um, and what Dave is looking for. What are, not being in my 20s or 30s anymore, what exactly is John at that age bracket? What exactly is he looking for? I know New Haven started um, building uh, companies around their employees and, and where they lived and the activities and stuff that they do. But what are some of those things that Wallingford does have? Yeah. So, so I think that it's a hard balance that we're going to have to find because you want the young people to come here, but you also don't want to ruin the small town, the community feel that you have by pumping in, you know, let's, you know, bars and clubs and stuff like that. That's not something that you want to build up. Um, so Wallingford has more alcohol establishments and we're a mile than, you know, any other place. Oh. So that a problem in Wallingford. I mean, actually, we actually broke records with that at one point. Um, oh, great. But that's not a problem at all. Um, but if, other you're things, in, if you're in the beer business, that's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wallingford actually is, we're, we're known for our alcohol establishments in, in a square mile, believe it or not. Um, but go on. What I'm, I'm really curious. I'm just curious, you know. Yeah, so I doing? think that uh, there are, I mean, I think most people want that city feel, but I think that increasingly people are trying to move away from the city just with everything going on with them and the expenses of them. Um, and so as a younger person, I think some of the main things you're looking for is one, a job. And so we need to make sure that people know that there's ample opportunity, but also costs because we are just out of college and we have student loans and a lot of debt. So we need to make sure that it's affordable living. So I think part of the um, preconceived notion about small towns in general is like that's where you go to retire or settle down and build a family you have to buy a house but in wallingford there's some really good apartment complexes and some good access to affordable housing i think making sure that's known and saying like you don't have to buy a house to live here there's ample apartments that you can live in um, there's good job opportunities here it's quiet but also um, to Tim's point, we have access to all the cities that you want, so you can take a weekend there. So I think um, pitching it as uh, this is where you can start a life. It doesn't have to be a city. You still have access to that part of, of uh, social life, but we have opportunities. We have affordable um, living, and you'll be much happier just from the quality of life. I think that um, as much as um, people want to uh, pitch um, this uh, lavish life in a city, it's not necessarily attainable for a college kid nowadays. So I think that just the two points of, um, you know, affordability and opportunity is good to hammer home to these kids. So uh, apartment availability is important as well. Um, Tim actually had me go do something. I went to it with him and we, we figured that out. It was a couple of years ago that, that your generation, um, you're not buying houses and it is true because of your debt with with college so you are looking for yeah for yeah especially right out of college like I'm, i mean i'm not gonna be able to buy a house so um i think that the preconceived preconceived notion is that out of or not sorry out of college but um when you go to a small city that's outside of the or when you go to a small town outside of a big city um you generally think that's where you start to buy a house and there might not be um apartment uh, complexes like you see in um, cities. So you have to make sure that we kind of make sure that we say, no, look, we have those kinds of apartments. It is affordable here, much affordable than the city. So you can still have the great quality of life at a better affordability. Tim actually uh, also brought in uh, a team, of, uh, a group that came in and they also had uh, stated something I thought was really important. New Haven had so many Airbnbs that they were running well on apartments because it was, a, you know, the, the new thing everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. Airbnb. So that's a plus for Wallingford as well. 
if we're not, you know, doing just all yeah. Airbnb rentals. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to raise, so I can definitely appreciate that from a New Englander standpoint, the, there's the big draws of the cities, New York, Boston, but I'm from the Midwest. We don't have big cities. The idea of going to a big city for most people that I grew up with was like, oh yeah, you visit a big city, but you don't want to go to a big city for any extended period of time or very often. It's kind of like a suburban mentality. And I think that you guys, it's great that you are pitching, hey, if you are interested in the cities, this is it. But you're missing out on an entire market of people who don't really want to be involved with the city. And so there's two ways to pitch this. One is the ready access to the cities. Look, you, hey, if you want to have that, that young lifestyle, you have that and you have nearby well-known places for development like that. Um, Stanford would be a, a great example. You can, half an hour away, you can go and they have a nightlife scene. Wallingford has a nightlife scene, but they're a little bit smaller. And then for those who are very much anti-city, you're far enough away. You don't have to worry about being bombarded with all the traffic from the cities. You don't have to worry about all those people coming in and, and demanding your time or not smiling at you when you walk across the street and stuff like that. So I think that you guys should have at least two potential um, personas. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a year ago, we were talking about pitching young people who wanted to work in the city, but wanted to live outside of the city for various reasons. Maybe it was cost, maybe they wanted the bucolic area. That, that was a year ago. Now COVID has come. Do you think that that's changed the mindset in young people where they say, I'm not sure I wanna work in a city anymore because of you know being crowded into an office area or a production area or anything else? Yeah. Uh, so, I'm, I'm just not quite sure who, what, what demographic, what we're pitching the demographic now. Yeah. So we have an interesting bifurcation here. You have the, the current mentality that's existed for long enough and will continue to exist for a while that there will be some shift. So for the, the next while, people will be making decisions in light of what the current life situation is, probably for another year or so. And then as things start to return to normal, then you're going to get people reverting back to old behaviors and habits. I don't think COVID has caused a large scale permanent shift in people's decision making. So I think what we need to do is be building towards the, who the potential customer is in three or four years. Because if we get people in the short term, they may be transitory. You don't think that COVID has changed things where people will be working from home more so a lot of people aren't going to go back or corp more so corporations aren't going to want them or need them to go back. Fair point. So to that extent, yes, there will be definitely a, a hey, you can work from home. But when the, the restrictions lift, while people really do enjoy the, the oh, hey, let's meet remotely and whatnot. My sense is that, and this could be entirely mistaken, but my sense is that the the desire for the in-person meetings is going to be really strong. It's going to be a factor that pulls people back and they're going to say, hey, we need to have meetings once a week in person. There's something about actually being able to see other people. And again, there will be a, a greater push towards the digital, but that in-person connection component is big. And that will probably continue to increase over time um, as people become, as the as COVID starts to fade back in memory or we become more normalized to whatever situation it's going to be, people will want to start meeting again in person. Because when you meet in person, there's more of a connection than you get with the, with the pure digital presence. So we're going to see a a pull back into that. And that means that if, even if it's just once a week and, oh man, I have to drive an hour and a half or I have to hop the train in order to get into the town and whatnot, that commute is going to weigh on people's minds. And I think that that's going to be a strong factor 
to say, well, even though I only have to do it once a week, it's enough of a pain that I am going to move closer to the city or possibly just move back to the city altogether. Yeah, the observation that I've had with several companies is that they've taken surveys of their people who have been, been remote. In my particular case, our people have not been as much remote as other companies. But with their people, and they ask, well, you know, we're going to be coming back at some time to some limited degree. Who's willing to do that? And it's better than 50%. It's closer to 60% say, I can't wait. When can we get back? I can't wait to get back. And yeah. so, and there are those people. There are people who are remote, who love remote and want to stay remote. And yep. they, they make it to a point where they make, make a decision, a business decision by saying, you know, you want me to come back, but I don't want to come back. I want to be remote. I'm going to find another job. You know, that kind of thing. So. Yeah. So across America, um, I think the statistic is about a third of people would qualify as an introvert. And for introverts, being able to be remote, being able to not having to necessarily come in person, that that's usually a much more fine thing. They still like some human interaction, but it's okay to not have to be there in a group. People who are more extroverted definitely want to have those interpersonal reactions. And there's a, a very big difference between a virtual interaction like this and an in-person interaction where you can actually see the person and see their full body language, not have to worry about interruptions to the connection. So there's going to be that pull. And you also have another factor, which is that most people who are in management and leadership positions are older. It's just they have more experience. They've had more time to build up the, to, to climb up the ladders and whatnot. And they're going to be putting a pressure to return things to what they're most comfortable with, which is in-person meetings. And so they, they'll adapt if they absolutely need to, but their preference is going to be probably a return to form. And so that's going to be pulling people back into physical meetings and whatnot. I think there's also the other factor of, you know, women that have, and men who have their children at home and just, they really need it. They need to be back at work because they need that private quiet space where they can focus. That's yes. what I'm saying about through my coworkers. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that one's going to be a very strong pull. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Just get me out of this house, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I think for those reasons, um, designing, a plan that works in the short term to attract people, but mostly for the long term, how do we attract people with the right mentality to say, yeah, Wallingford is my place, my long term place, as opposed to Wallingford is my stopover place for right now. I think a factor we're going to have to consider, too, is that we're kind of in a real estate bubble right now, and it's going to have to burst at some point. The prices that people are asking and stuff is quite high, and I've seen it burst you know, a few times, 88. Um, once again so that's a factor we have to because that's going to affect people's mindset tremendously as to where they want to live and what, what they want to do that's a really good point yeah. so I, we may have gone a little bit far afield from where we yeah, no, where you I'm were just, going there Jet. Yeah. but i think that this was a good discussion simply because recognizing all the different potential target markets and the mentalities that we're building and are we designing a strategy for the short term versus the long term those are all different factors that we want to include and so having marketing strategies for right now versus marketing strategies that can be set in order to either lead to fruition later on or strategies that we say okay once COVID has settled down and plus some number of months, now we can start implementing these approaches would be really useful. Hmm. Yeah, these are odd times we live in. Yes. So, sorry, Jack, did you have more recommendations? Yep. That, that, that was the end of my section. So we have, we have more of the document, but that was the end of my section. Cool. All right, so the first thing that I looked into was um, getting the media to come to Wallingford regularly, and um, this would help show that the town's uh, very multidimensional rather than just beneficial to one group of residents, uh, one group of residents or businesses. Um, so we think that in writing these articles, we could get not only QU journalism students, but journalism students at um, all the surrounding colleges to specifically write the articles. And then in terms of what types of articles we feel would be beneficial to write. Um, we think that we should look at local newspapers to kind of see what they currently have written and um, kind of what's currently catching people's attention. Um, 
And then another way through getting the media to come could be through a speaker series to kind of bring in a speaker, whether it's an entrepreneur in Wallingford or a small business um, and kind of getting them to talk at a forum or at colleges. And um, this would not only help kind of get their name out there and get media attention, but also kind of help college students see if that if it's a business that, that they might want to work at in the future. Um, and another way could be through the school systems. So kind of getting classes to do community service that they could get uh, media attention for or kind of getting them to do um, unusual things that might catch the media's attention. Um, and then also just kind of catching people's interviews, uh, whether that's businesses or residents, kind of just getting them to, to tell their story. Um, so we can do this through both articles written by journalism students or video documentaries um, so that these can be both published in local online papers, but also shared online on Facebook, LinkedIn, or other social media platforms. Um, and then in getting these stories out, so kind of figuring out how to get them out for people to see, um, we think that they should first be posted on social media because social media is a very easy way for these articles to be spread, whether it's um, them being posted in forums on Facebook for people to share or just being posted on LinkedIn so that people can, when somebody likes it, they see their posts come up in their feed. Um, and the ability for these posts to be shared is definitely effective because once they're out there, they need to be seen by people. So kind of getting social media to, to do the sharing for the articles, I think would be very beneficial. Um, and then the more people that share it, the more people that see it and the higher that it'll come up on the search, um, or Wallingford. Um, and then another way to get information out would be through a media list um, so that press releases could be sent out to both residents and um, businesses in Wallingford. Um, and then we think that in also seeing what types of um, articles would be, would be of interest to businesses that we should interview um, existing businesses in Wallingford and kind of see what ideas they think would be interesting for um, articles, like what things would interest them to kind of see what would attract uh, new potential businesses to Wallingford. And then in pushing small business growth, um, we think that we should start off with the promotion of local farmers market or green market, because just it's like a very uh, healthy environment, kind of bringing everybody together, bringing the community together. Um, and then next, the resources offered to small businesses should be definitely um, more outlined than uh, within the big businesses so that people that own small businesses kind of have a separate way of seeing all the resources that are available to them um, rather than having to like see everything as one big thing and then they can kind of have trouble searching through it. Um, and if they're able to see a more structured outline with information specifically for them, um, it makes them a lot more uh, available to read it. And then in terms of finding small businesses, we think that it could be very effective to reach out directly to small businesses in local uh, areas, so other towns, and whether that be cold calling or um, just visiting or just sending out uh, informational packets um, and kind of just providing them with uh, sp specific information as to how that they could succeed in Wallingford. Um, and that might influ influence them to relocate. And then another way um, in reaching out to businesses could be through a mass email sent out to businesses in, lo in local towns, um, promoting programs in Wallingford, uh, what benefits they would receive through these new programs in Wallingford, and basically telling them why it would be effective for them to move their business to Wallingford. Okay, very good, Jen. Okay, you have some things to add to that? Um, yeah, so I had to do um, promoting Wallingford as a STEM community. Um, so we kind of just talked about how we think that Wallingford should use their website and social media to promote themselves as a STEM community. 
Um, so we believe that they can like show it by showing that they have their students engaged in the relevant learning experiences in order to um, kind of prepare, prepare them for their career and their future. Um, so I think that this will also like show not only the community and the businesses that they're um, already preparing for like a strong workforce and they're already um, just putting Wallingford ahead of other um, towns when it comes to workforce. Um, so we also discussed that it'll not only appeal to businesses who are looking for a strong workforce, it'll appeal to families who are looking for like a good schooling system for their children. Um, so we talked about a big factor that comes into play when families are moving is the education system that the town has. Um, so we believe that showing Wallingford as a STEM program, showing them that it provides the opportunity for students to have the experience to um, enter like the manufacturing um, like uh, field and just like show them that like we're already preparing the students for um, the future. It'll be a way to attract families too. Um, so when we were looking, um, we found that they have Tech Trep Academy, Legends of Learning and Nareva. Um, and so we could, we think that we should like show these off more um, and kind of show off like what they, what the pro they're, all of them are programs. Um, that's like options for the kids to enroll in. One of them was like a six week course over the summer. Um, and it's offered to different levels of education. Um, so we believe that like, if we showed this off more, um, it'll definitely increase, um, it'll definitely like show how we are a STEM community and how we're preparing the students of Wallingford. Um, for their future. And then we also think that it might be beneficial to show real life experiences from students who believed like the skills they gained in the STEM program um, worked to their benefit in the real world. So even if it was just interviewing somebody who um, was in a certain program and believed that it helps them now in their job, even something as small as that, we think it could be beneficial. Um, and then we also think that the Hubcap program is definitely something that should be highlighted more on the website. Um, I wasn't aware of the Hubcap program until I interviewed with a, one of the brokers. Um, and we basically just think that they should promote like what's available to the, in the community, what it involves and the industries that it benefits. Um, so when I was speaking to um, the Ulbricht Stainless Steel CEO, he told me that basically um, the Hubcap program has like a six week course on the introduction of manufacturing jobs. And it even like secures priority in hiring from HR from certain companies after completing the course. Um, so this was something that I found interesting because it's an easy way to target people who are seeking like manufacturing jobs, seeking like a middle-class lifestyle, um, and it's easy to be like, well, if you do this and go through this course, you'll get priority in hiring, um, which is a, I, which what we thought was a really big deal. And then um, we also believe that Wallingford could further their relationships with companies in the Hubcat program. Um, and by this, we mean like if businesses were to suggest um, what courses they would want offered, um, kind of like taking in consideration what they want, um, what they are looking for employees, if we could offer any courses that would benefit them. Um, so kind of giving them almost a say in the type of workforce that Wallingford's producing. Um, it'll increase the chances of businesses wanting to relocate in Wallingford um, just because they're almost getting um, like direct say in what the type of employees that they are getting um, and how they'll be already almost like qualified for the jobs that they want to hire for. Um, and then we also talked about partnerships with local schools and universities. So on their website, we think that they should do, um, they should show off what they're doing for STEM and manufacturing companies in terms of what courses are offered in the schools, which I already mentioned. And then um, just kind of promote how like Wallingford as a town of like opportunity 
um, to businesses with like the ability to like dive into um, a strong workforce and just talk about how we have been pre preparing these kids since elementary school to college. Um, we also, I know we already mentioned um, the colleges that surround us, including like Yale, Quinnipiac, Sacred Heart, UConn, Southern, um, as an opportunity for the businesses to dive into those um, colleges. The, like once the students graduate from there, obviously there's gonna be a high demand in jobs from them. They're gonna be looking for jobs. We also wanted to mention that they, those schools should probably be like on the top of the list. We think that they have more of a higher chance of locating in Connecticut and residing in Connecticut post-grad than probably any other college. Um, just because either they're already here or they already know what Connecticut's about. Um, so we think it's important to highlight that the companies will be able to pull from these colleges post-graduation. Um, and we believe that Wallingford could capitalize on this by, like like he sa John said before, creating some type of program with them. Um, if Wallingford were to have some sort of trade show, where businesses could come and meet the students of these colleges and show the relationship that Wallingford has created with these students and these businesses and kind of just like bringing them together. Um, we believe that that'll look good on Wallingford and it'll also provide opportunity for students and it would provide opportunity for businesses. Um, so what and, I'm hearing, as, as I'm sorry to pick you up, what I'm hearing um, collectively is that uh, and you guys are discovering, you know, bit by bit, that Wallingford has a, a good selling program. A lot of good stuff going on, right? So it's, it's our geography, it's our quality of life, it's our affordability, um, it's our, um, uh, certainly our, our STEM, you know, uh, initiatives that we work so closely with the, the, the Board of Education on. There, there's so many things to sell. And it's, you know, we're making this list. That's all good stuff. And really, I think we, we need to um, we need to really start digging in. And what's rolling in my mind is okay. So we can build this great selling story and pieces of it. But then, who are we going to get it? Who are we going to sell it to? And how are we going to reach the people that we wanted to reach? And um, I think yeah, there's there's that's going to be our next phase. I think if we continue to, to go through. Yeah. Oh, Patricia. Just yeah, I just want to go. <clears throat> so we have a STEM Academy in Wallingford. It's, it's through, it, it works out of the Spanish community of Wallingford. Um, that's one thing. We were also declared, I believe, a STEM town. Weren't we? Len Fasano came down and declared a STEM town. Wallingford's a STEM, right. STEM town. Yeah. So that was a... Community in the state of I'm sorry, what was that, Tim? We were the first designated STEM community in the state of Connecticut. Exactly. Um, so the STEM Academy, the STEM town. Oh, and as far as <clears throat> great ideas, Shay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, our superintendent has spoken to businesses throughout throughout the town to um, help develop the hub cap as well as the um, education program for the students of Wallingford. So that is something we that we have already done, um, but it it puts focus on the fact that we haven't advertised that stuff. I mean, you know, all these good things that you came up with we've already done and we're doing yeah we um, just don't so no, no one would know yeah um yeah like we said before i didn't really know much about the hubcap program before so i think it's important to not only highlight as as a the hubcap program and as a stem community um so we definitely should figure out a way of getting that out there to the public whether it's on the website um or some other way that we could come up with um, but I definitely think that our target market would be families who are looking to move and businesses who are also looking to move. Um, just because I think that a STEM community for a family shows a lot. Um, I know that like when my parents were moving, like the number one thing they were looking at is the education system um, because that's like an important factor. So I think that we definitely should be able to highlight that and kind of get information out about what you guys have been doing already um, and just make it more available to the public. Um, and then I, oh, sorry. Great, great, great. So great points. You know, the, the Hubcap is a collaborative effort 
between the Board of Education and the business community. So mm -hmm. what, I, I'm so pleased with these reports today because what you guys are uncovering is a lot of the things that we've been working on and you're recognizing them as our strengths. What we are, I would say, very, very um, inept at is telling the world our story. We're, we're, mm -hmm. you, you guys are sharing story after story after story, which is all stuff that's terrific. So I'm glad you're discovering it. But boy, we're not telling enough people about, about all the <laughs> things we're doing. So that becomes the magic behind everything that you're learning is how do we take and start weaving this, all these, these great stories and messages, which I know I think Samantha and uh, Kalen were going to be talking about in a couple of minutes, um, as to how we get the message out. So uh, thank you. Great job. Were you, were you done, Jay? Or? Um, I have one more. Um, okay. So my last thing was just how we're going to promote Wallingford through com commercial brokers. Um, I know John kind of mentioned it before, but we kind of to dive in deeper. We were talking about if it was even a possibility to incentivize business ref referrals to Wallingford. Um, because we think that that would definitely increase the chances of a commercial bro broker referring to the town of Wallingford. Um, we just didn't really know if that was possible and how much control we have over that. Um, and then we also believe that we think that the town of Wallingford has already established deep connections with brokerage firms from what it seems. So we think that if we were able to capitalize on these relationships, it would increase the chance of a broker referring to the town of Wallingford. And by that, um, we mean whether it's using um, other brokers to give information and kind of like expand like their relationship by like saying good things about Wallingford, whether it's like through word of mouth um, or whether it's like you mentioned before, sending out pamphlets, reports, or profiles to either the brokerage firm itself or um, individual broker brokers and just kind of highlight the benefits of Wallingford and why they should be referring the um, town of Wallingford to businesses. I We also think it's important to just highlight that a lot of the um, businesses that we talked to during the interviews, they were going they were finding um, spaces, like figuring out what town they wanted to move through, through brokers. Um, a lot of them, almost all of the ones that we spoke with were using e either the website or they were using commercial broker brokers. Um, so I think it's important to notice that we're not really, like we're also marketing to the brokers. Like we're not, obviously we're marketing to businesses, but if the main way that they're finding um, places to relocate is through brokers. We need to be marketing to the brokers so that they know what they should be telling um, businesses and they should be able to know all the benefits of Wallingford and everything that Wallingford has to offer so that they can, because they're almost like our spokesperson if they are the ones that are referring people to our town. Um, so we think it's important to um, be marketing to brokers as well as businesses. Um, and yeah, then, yeah. Very good. All right. Great observation in terms of the brokerage community. So I had the last section of our marketing strategy, which was social media specific marketing strategies. And we thought this was an important topic to touch on, even though it wasn't necessarily in the initial bullet points we got. Uh, because social media is a good way of getting the information out to a wider community than just putting it on the website. And we thought that the main social media sites that we should look at are Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, they reach two very different demographics. Facebook reaches a broad swath of the local community. LinkedIn is better targeted for businesses or for um, specific targeting of the workforce. Uh, we also thought Instagram would be a good secondary focus to look for and attract younger generations. And for more of a community building purpose, it would be a great place to post photos of the community um, and local small business uh, information. And for the Facebook page, we thought our strategy would be best to target specific community groups or groups that businesses are a part of. Uh, so looking into if local businesses might find any information from a specific Facebook group would be uh, one way of looking at this. Uh, some of the community groups we found, we found three good Wallingford community uh, Facebook groups. 
And we thought that one way to get information out through those would be to post stories that we had written to those community groups so they could be shared among a broader group of people. Uh, any good photos we had to be posted there uh, so that they could uh, get onto like an image search through Google so our image search would be better. Um, and also to post any like small business information that we had, if any events were going on, uh, posting those to a Facebook group would be a great way of getting more people involved with the local small business community. Uh, for our LinkedIn strategy, we wanna look at the forums, pages, and search terms that local businesses and our target industries wanna use. And then by spreading information that they might wanna see through those um, uses. And that way we can put out uh, ways to incentivize businesses to look at Wallingford. Uh, we can put out pamphlets that describe the benefits of Wallingford. And then we can also target local workforce with work-related opportunities uh, and other opportunities that are within the town of Wallingford that would help us attract younger people who might want to consider working in Wallingford. Uh, for the Instagram page, let me just let me just jump in with a question. So, um, I, I agree with what you're saying. Opportunities are there, no doubt. I, I, we need to give some thought to the structure of the account. For example, right now we have a LinkedIn presence, but it's me, and I'm not so sure. And I'm not I'm not a, a, um, a proficient user of LinkedIn, so. I, I, I seldom post, which is a shortcoming. Um, let me digress and say, in, in the last seven days, there's been five days that the local newspaper has covered business-related stories that have all been positive in the top of line. So the local media pays attention. We have you know, good communication. We have great access. But Tim Ryan doesn't say, then take that story and post it, all right? So, which is a missed opportunity, and I realize that. The next thing I always say in my mind is, so should an individual build the audience? Because, you know, LinkedIn, I look at it every single day. Typically at night when I'm relaxing, I go on LinkedIn just to see who's communicating. Plenty of brokers are on there that I communicate with and, and you know, that I guess you friend them. Or, but it becomes, how do you build the audience, right? How do you build the audience that you want? Because typically everything I see is, individual driven so someone has to be the spokesperson uh, that starts to build the audience so i'm not saying we need to answer that question now but we are getting um to the point where we're getting right down to the nuts and bolts right um is building building the that um i, I have some other you know questions i guess about facebook uh, LinkedIn is where I see most of the business activity frankly going on, but I, w I really admit I li I'm limited. I'm not, a, I'm not a social media guy, so, which is why we've got all of you on that side. All right, so we, we need to become much more proficient at that. But let's, let's think about that for next time as to you know, who should be the face uh, of the, or, or do you need a face? I, I think people would be less likely to communicate if it simply said economic development. I, I think there's a personality. There's a, you know, we, there's a, the person who drives the relationships um, that needs to really be the persona behind LinkedIn. And um, that's been, at least been my experience. But I would defer to your judgment at a, at, a, at a future exercise. So, David, I'm kind of looking at your cube there saying, all right, let's keep that in mind for next assignment. Because I already have it written down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good, Brenda. Thank you. Yeah, I know, with, I know with LinkedIn especially, none of us are, we're all a little on the younger side. We're like kind of just getting into LinkedIn and just figuring it out. So that was definitely one of the sides of social media where like I've used Facebook for a while. Like I know how to handle Facebook. I don't as much know about LinkedIn. So finding people, probably talking to a career development at the school would be a next step for us uh, to figure out how they might advise using LinkedIn or how they see businesses using LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anthony Bacalli is not on the call today. Um, he is the marketing you know, specialist at Pops and Monster, which is a medical device manufacturing firm, and he does LinkedIn regularly. Yeah. So, 
Um, it's a matter of A, being um, um, cognizant enough to make sure that you've got a message. Um, I do see some people that are so frequent with messages on LinkedIn, frankly, it becomes wallpaper, they overdo it. Um, so there's a, there's a, you know, how much is enough, how much is too much. Um, but the big thing is building the right target, building the right network of people within the LinkedIn you know, world. So, uh, I mean, for me to be talking to, talking to, um, well, for me not to be speaking to brokers and site selectors and potential business people, how do I build that audience? So those are all things that we need to be working yeah. So we've got, as you guys are all saying, uh, and again, I'm so pleased that you are discovering week by week that Wallingford's got a great selling story. We, we are an asset rich community. And the, the thing is that we are, we are not very good at bragging about ourselves. And um, you guys are discovering that we've got a lot to brag about. We just need to do it. Um, and to the point where I have uh, given some consideration to um, uh, an assignment within you know, my office, which is an office of two people, mind you. <laughs> uh, but an assignment that says we have to need a social media, you know, someone to focus on the social media presence in the office. Just to be, so that's top of mind every day. You know, what message do we send out today? To what audience? Who did we reach? You know, that, that, so. Yeah. The last social media site we looked at was Instagram, which would be more of a secondary focus just because it does sort of hit a similar target demographic as Facebook, but more so on the younger side, like uh, younger side, like millennials and younger. And we think it would mostly mirror the information that the Facebook page would have in terms of content uh, with uh, small business promotion and sharing photos of the town. Uh, there's a couple of similar Instagram pages that we based what we think would be a good idea off of. Uh, there's one for Chester, Connecticut, and there, there's one for Western Connecticut as well. Um, and we think that one of the things that they do well is small business spotlights, uh, where they let small businesses kind of take over their Instagram, which is a feature you can do. Uh, so more of their information gets out. Uh, as well as using that for like the photo contest so that uh, one of the things we found was that an, a Google image search of Wallingford turns up a lot of buildings and not as much pretty scenery that shows off like the beauty of the town and like the good images of the town. And so by holding a photo contest, that would be a really easy way um, to get good pictures of the town onto a Google image search. Um, and I think mostly with building the Instagram page, I don't think it would be that hard. Uh, it doesn't seem that time consuming, uh, mostly because of the way that Instagram's algorithm works. Once you follow a couple of people, you end up on their friends, like suggested friends search. And so it's really easy to build a large following on Instagram. So I don't think a lot of time would have to be put into that, which is why we considered it as a secondary focus. Very good, Brad. Thank you. Good report. Um, Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, Samantha, do you want to share the presentation? Okay, so we dove deeper into what exactly needed to be done to redesign the website. We did a situation analysis and um, started to make the framework for our recommendations. So first I'll start with the situation analysis. On the left, you'll see a screenshot of the current landing page that we've been using, which is the slash businesses on the end of the URL. Um, so that's what I'll be referring to slash business versus slash Y Wallingford, which is the other page that we think has more potential in terms of being able to tell the story that we've spent um, so long working with and developing and just talking about today. 
Um, and you'll see on the side of this page that there are 12 um, separate tabs. I don't know if my mouse is showing up on here, but there are 12 tabs over here that um, we think at least these three can be consolidated and the incentive programs as well. We can, I think like John said earlier, we can take some information from all of this, um, from all of these sources, develop a better um, way of telling that story in one page to make that user experience better and reduce the, the clicks. And if they do want more information, there is somewhere else that they can go to download those um, uh, demographic profiles or to download the videos if they wanted to watch or and we had talked about embedding the videos into that page in the first place but what we're seeing right now is the business page we're using um, doesn't have as compelling of a story as the why walling grid page could have um, and that's what i've pictured here so if you look at the next the next yes, one yep i know you, you spoke to lynn but what did we find out about the level of flexibility that we have to work with the CMS and, and making changes and updates to the web. So that's something we wanted to talk to you about. We have that on our next um, our next step slide um, at the very end of this, but I it didn't seem like Lynn, she said that she was in charge of editing and managing the content. Do you have a specific page that's like consistently updated, like monthly or something? No. No, okay. So as far as what she was able to help me with, she just kind of gave me the information for Google Analytics. She made me an administrator. Um, that's what I had emailed you about. And that's mm -hmm. where we found this information. And I was on the phone with Web Solutions, which seems to be um, the firm that you guys have been working with to develop the website. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Right. So I think what we could do and, and what we will talk about later in terms of actually making these changes is just developing the design and then passing it on to them to make the changes. Um, something else that we wanted to talk about is it's important to have a consistent um, flow, a consistent stream of content. It doesn't have to be like really frequent, but at least updating on the monthly, every bi-monthly, bi-weekly, something like that. Um, and that would require being able to make changes on our end. Right, so you, you didn't see any technical um, showstoppers in terms of making our website more vibrant? Uh, not that I can think of, Colin, do you have any? Well, what did you, what do you mean by that? Um, that would be looking well, at the correct. There's been a fair amount of conversation about how we need to make our website more robust. There's been a lot of discussion as to content, how to make it more robust. I just want to make sure technically that there's not something that would not allow us to do that. Do that. Well, so as far as as far as we're aware, we didn't get uh, a whole lot of information from the contact um, with Longford on how we might go about making changes, but just through looking through the uh, the services that are being used to support the website. It doesn't look like there's a clear way to make changes um, unless, unless there's some sort of content management system set up that uh, I don't know about. But we were thinking of developing the design and the copy for a more optimized page as a way that we could simply provide the agency with something to work off of based on our research. But um, so looking at the slide right now, the one of the biggest takeaways that we think is really hurting the effectiveness on the page is the fact that 72% of people, well, so only 2% of the people that are actually visiting the business page are getting to Y Wallingford. Y Wallingford we identified as the page which has the most compelling information and has the broadest um, overarching information describing the economic development incentives. And so this is really hurting us because uh, a lot of people are simply visiting that that short page that has, um, I think, one or two paragraphs and then leaving. And so we want to make sure that we're optimizing that first landing page and then building a really strong domain authority in that one page as a means of uh, growing the page as a resource. So um, hey, do you want to go to the uh, next slide? Do you guys have view time on each of those pages? 
We have access to that information. I don't have that in front of me right now, but. I was just wondering simply because it'd be interesting to see if people who are going to Y Wallingford are reading through the page or if they're bouncing off from there too. It's, it's pretty, I remember it being pretty short. I mean, there's not a whole lot of content on the landing page. I mean, on the first slide, I don't know if, uh, Samantha, can you go back to the first slide? So that's on the left-hand side, that is all the content that's there. And it, it's not a whole lot. And that's, that's the problem. Um, and so it, we wanted to, I mean, even if someone did come across the page, I don't think that they could spend a whole lot of time or find a whole lot of resources just by looking at this. And totally the fact that only 2% are continuing on to Y Wongford, which is really the place where all that content is right now. Um, and it, it is really not helpful. Um, and so I think it's, I don't remember if it was 2% of the overall site traffic or 2% of people that went from uh, the business page to Y Wongford page, but um, so uh, can we go to the third slide? So our recommendation for strengthening Y Wallingford. Um, so we're, we're recommending that we move all of the content that is on Y Wallingford and then also compressing several of the other pages that are currently uh, tabs on the left-hand side into a really strong landing page that's built to uh, optimize for people that are coming across the page that could be in a position to want to uh, relocate. And so this is really helpful for a number of different reasons. I mean, the first being that it actually helps our SEO because from speaking with uh, a digital marketing specialist, Will, we learned that it's really important to focus on building strong domain authority in, in one page rather than several other pages. And uh, it actually hurts us to have several other pages because you're uh, spreading the authority across, um, you know, like a, a video tab, for example, which right now is a separate page, rather than building um, this one page that can be served up as a result for people that are looking for a number of different queries. And then uh, the other main benefit is that it, it's also helpful for, uh, for building a stronger user experience. And people, the more people have to click on a page, the less likely they are to actually ever do anything. And that's shown pretty strongly by the fact that only 2% of people are clicking the Y Longford. Um, and so the screenshot is from that Y Longford page. And as you can see, there's already a lot more content there than on the main landing page. And in fact, if you were on the actual website, you could scroll to see a whole lot of other content. Um, so the other thing that we recommend is moving all of the, the videos to simply be embedded on the page which would also help um, bring people to that page. Moving um, all the content that we have, one of the other groups was talking about it earlier, but having kind of at a glance information for the incentive programs on that page too would be really helpful. So we could throw some strong numbers on the, for example, the amount of average savings a business could expect if they moved. Um, and the overarching theme here is that we're optimizing for user experience, but we're also designing this page to be used as as a landing page which means that it's it's built with a purpose that's serving our, our marketing strategy and it's it's designed to really do something um, one of the other things that would help is having a success stories one of the other groups was talking about having like a business spotlight for uh, businesses in wallingford where we could talk they could talk on our behalf on what uh what benefits they received after they relocated. And then um, the other big thing that we discovered is really helpful is having an FAQ for right now, Wallingford actually has decent SEO. It's not, it's not standing above um, other towns, but uh, we're ranking strongly for pretty basic searches like Wallingford, which is to be expected. And that's, that's good. But to make it better, we want to be ranking for, for search terms for people that are looking for um, either strong incentives for towns to relocate to or for businesses that are looking for really strong, vibrant communities and workforces. And having an FAQ where we could have 
commonly asked questions and serve those up to people that are looking would help put the website in front of those people that are already posed to want to make a decision. And I just want to build on that really quickly. So the Why Wallingford page is going to be the place digitally where we get to do the bragging and where we get, well, we'll be able to house all the information that everybody's just done all this research on. Um, like Shay was talking about the STEM programs. Uh, this, is, this is the place where that can be um, promoted. And then using this page and pushing it out to LinkedIn or pushing it out through Instagram and things like that is, is how we will continue to build the strategy. So uh, as, far as, as far as the existing SEO goes, um, as I said, it's, it's somewhat decent right now. We've got some pretty strong backlinks pointing to us that um, include like the, the state of Connecticut, but one of the strongest things we found that other towns were doing that we're, uh, we're not doing quite as well is building relationships with Chamber of Commerces to try to get them to link back to our site. And those we found to be some of the strongest um, backlinks so that was actually sending valuable traffic to different websites. And now, so just, just, uh, just for your edification, you know, we have a fabulous relationship with the Chamber of Commerce. But again, what you've uncovered is another opportunity that we are missing, not, not leveraging that relationship and helping drive traffic and um, awareness to our site. So, good point. Good point. Thank you. So, um, like I said before, something that is going to be pretty obvious moving forward is that content creation is kind of the biggest obstacle that that digital marketing, um, in terms of consistently maintaining it, content creation is the, the thing where you can kind of fall off the train that you're, that you're headed on, or you can, I don't know what I'm talking about right now, sorry. But content creation is where we're going to have to spend the most time really making sure that we're dedicated to. And this can be in the form of blogging, newsletters, article updates. And then, like we said, those success stories and being able to make a section on the page where we can talk about that. But we were talking to Will and he said that, I mean, it might be difficult to pull somebody in from the town of Wallingford um, and have them be in charge of, you know, developing this content on a bi-weekly basis or something like that, but there's also copywriters that you can hire and just give them titles and keywords and they cost between $200 and $300 for, for a, a decent copywriter. Um, but consistency and quality are more important than the quantity of um, the actual articles or, or the content that we're rolling out. But copy is also very important just on the landing pages as well. So those, uh, those titles and keywords she's talking about also could be things like the commonly searched queries that we were talking about for people um, that already pose to want to make a decision to either relocate to Wallingford. And so we could come up with, we could find research for the most commonly searched questions that led into a conversion in that area and then develop articles built around that so that we're optimizing the page to be served up to those people. Um, so moving on from that, one thing that I kept coming back to when we were doing this research was how does developing this website or developing this landing page um, really translate into our end goal of bringing more business into Wallingford? And I think Colm touched on that in the beginning slides where this will be kind of the center of um, the digital presence and having the clear presence across all platforms is what's really going to take us into the digital age of being able to market ourselves. And Will was saying, don't underestimate the power of LinkedIn for lead generation. But in order to have an effective um, outreach program digitally, you need to, to really fortify the, the landing page that you're bringing people to from these different platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. So that's why um, the web presence is going to be the core of the strategy, and then we can kind of branch out from there. Very good. Mr. Chair, I'm mindful of the time. Oh, you guys so, oh no, okay, I'm sorry. I thought you for some reason that you were. Right. 
Well, just to summarize, I mean, our, our next steps really are to focus on developing an early strong landing page that compresses a lot of that information into mm-hmm. one place. And then building that page around the idea that uh, once so, once we are actually reaching out to potential people that are in that C-level um, executive group, we have a really strong page that we can send them to that's already built and optimized uh, to help them make their decision. Probably move to next steps. What's that? Sorry, I thought I was limited on time. I just wanted to summarize uh, the next steps. But so, do you guys have any questions for us? No, I think I think the next step for us, beyond your next steps, is to have the professor kind of guide us along. And I'd like to start seeing us get. And this is this is a good start to get to that point to start consolidating this information to come up with a clear. And it's not going to happen next time we meet, but we're going to have to get to a clearer message and the best way of uh, executing that clearer message. So uh, we talked about it a little bit last time we met. We seem to be making progress towards that. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask the professor to kind of lead us to the next step then that we want to start working towards, being mindful of exams and everything else coming up. So. Yeah. If I could jump in, it is it is almost 9.30. Um, is everybody okay with hanging out for another 15 minutes, or everybody got to jump, or what's going on? Thumbs up if we hang out for another 15. Okay. Everybody's good? All right. Samantha, I didn't see you. Are you good? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. 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 <laughs> so, do you have to go, Patricia? Yeah. So, so Professor, what do you think uh, we should do for... Uh, our next steps. So I have next steps, but we also had one group that we didn't hear back from, which was uh, Chandler. Yeah, I have to go. Yeah. Um, so just so that we are cognizant of time, I do have next steps. Um, I will, I've been keeping track of them. And so I'll be more than happy to give a quick report out, but I want to give Chandler a chance so that way I can see if I need to update this. So I apologize. No problem, don't worry. Um, I quickly looked at like the process that Wallingford goes through now when submitting an application for the planning and zoning. So I'll go back to the Dave uh, customer like persona and Dave goes and he submits his application to planning and zoning. Then on the planning and zoning side, they send it if required, it's it's not always required to inland wa- uh, wetlands and water course, and they're an agency set up to like balance the the need for economic development and the need to protect our environment. So they would look at like if the site had a watershed and they can do certain things on the site. And so um, then after they get the go ahead from inland uh, wetlands and water course, they would then go, the application would then go back to planning and zoning and be um, talked about and discussed with the departments and that's um, the health department, the building department, um, the, the engineering department and so on. And so what they do is they check for compliancy like with the plants and so, um, then they get back to go back and forth with the the business or whoever is applying dave who's applying and then um eventually they get to a public meeting where they discuss whether the the plan has been approved or unapproved and so after that meeting if they get approved they could then build on the site if they don't then they can't build on the site and they start the process all over again, whether with the same site or a different site. And so what Tim's biggest problem with this is that it takes about four to six months to do this plan, like go through this this process. And so four to six months, you could build a, a shopping center rather than just get it approved. So we, as Wallingford, we want to improve that so that we're more agile in the business, um, in the business world, so that we see we are seen as a more business friendly um, 
a town. And so um, one problem that some of the top problems that Wallingford has is that it, like I just mentioned, it's time. It takes a lot of time. They also do like manual delivery of this information. So um, information could get lost if, um, if the departments haven't um, gotten back to the city planner, then uh, the, that plan, that, that proposal doesn't move forward to the next step. So it, it just drags the process on. And for a business, this means money, time is money. And so I looked at all the, the towns that the past group had looked at, like um, Billerica and the other, like Windsor, and only one town had an automated solution for this. And that was North, uh, North Haven. And so I signed up for their, um, their automated system and it was very basic. So what it had was a place where I could do the sign up online for a permit and just fill in my name, the address like this, and then upload the, the plans, the engineering plans, whatever, the survey maps, whatever they needed. And so um, it wasn't super in depth, but then I also looked at um, LA and New York just to see like what they do. And they're more, they do this, like North Haven does this probably similarly to Wallingford in the fact that they want to be um, agile with businesses and be a more business friendly town. New York and LA do this more so because they, need to um they just have so many people la is a city of four million um new york's a city of eight million they they need they just don't have the manpower so they do it due to pure volume rather than um being agile so um i looked at i looked at a couple softwares but um four stood out to me there's City Grow, uh, Gov Pilot, Excella, and Citizen Serve, and City Grow and um, Citizen Serve. They focus primarily on the um, the planning and zoning process, like the workflows of that. And um, Excella and Gov Pilot, they're more so focused on bringing the entire government into one one system so um city grow it had the most like it had the fewest features because they're a newer company they were five years old and so they had the fewest features but they were the most like variable in like robust because they had conditional um conditional logic and like customizable forms so like they can um, they can change the form to and the, the process to Wallingford's process rather than being like a clear, uh, a cookie cutter form. And they will work with the city of LA to um, do the, the permitting for their sidewalk expansion. And so I feel that if they're working with a city of 4 million, then um, they can easily work with a city of 45,000 like Wallingford. Um, what I liked about them was that they had a 30 day free trial. So you could set up the processes and you could work with um, CityGov to, um, to set up your workflows before you, you spend the money. Um, their cost is $10,000 for, they do it based upon population. So um, a city between 25,000 to 100,000 people cost about $10,000 and they do take transaction fees. Now moving to Gov Planet, they're, like I mentioned, they're full service. They like, they integrate all the, the different aspects of government and that's like the court system, the clerk department. Um, and so what I mentioned in my report is that this might be an easier sell to, to get the money for, from the mayor or whoever you have to get it from um, to buy the system because it's not just going to go towards improving 
um, the Planning and Zoning Commission, it's going to improve all the government. Um, then the next uh, company I looked at was Excella and their like of um, plant pilot uh, where they're full service, but um, they had less features than Gov Pilot, and so, but they also worked with a lot, like a, a lot of really large cities, like Philadelphia, Washington D.C., um, and uh, and a bunch of other ones. And so, I feel like that because these guys worked with a lot of of larger cities that they have proven them, themselves in the marketplace, but um, they had less features than GovPilot. And then CitizenServe was, it had the least features of all of them and they um, focus only on planning and zoning. And they mentioned that their cost was based upon um, the the users using the the site meaning the employees how many employees wallingford was going to have used the site and so i put in that they had that you guys used 16 employees and that was based upon the information i got from the application because i needed to submit 16 sets of plans for um for the building application so I use 16 as my baseline and that would cost $28,800 plus um, there's a setup fee in the initial year. So um, I feel like with this, it would definitely help you guys being like with an automated system, it would definitely increase your, your workflows and it would definitely cut down the time it takes to get like from um, I just applied to I'm now building in Wallingford, but um, it, it would definitely, it costs a lot of money because $10,000 is obviously no small amount. And so I, I basically said um, that you're at least going to get out of, you're not going to get out of paying at least $10,000 for a system like this. I, I just got a call while we were on this call from Excella, so I'll talk to them later today about their prices and, and everything. Awesome. Okay, so this actually, th th that was helpful because I think that we need to hit the process component as the ongoing because that is going to be a key piece and it integrates actually well with everything else. So. Let me propose this for next week, or not next week, for two weeks, the 30th. So the day after our very short Thanksgiving break. Uh, for the marketing tactics, we have, I think the very first thing is that we need to start out with creating personas for all of the different target markets. And this ties into the idea of, hey, we need to have messages that we're sending to each of these groups. So that means the recognizing that we have different groups for the residents and the workforce. So what are getting more personas, getting more detailed about who those target markets are, and then what's the message or messages that will resonate with those. Creating a persona for businesses that Wallingford is trying to recruit and creating a persona for the brokers that we are trying to approach. So using those as the, the initial frameworks, then what are the message or messages that we need to call out? Essentially, what are the value propositions that will make them say, wow, this is a place that I want to come live, stay, work, build a, a business there. For the recommendations that you guys have, what I think the next step is, it, if you come up with more ideas, great. You guys came up with a ton of really awesome things. I was, took a nearly two pages of notes off of that. And uh, what we need to do now is to consolidate that into an actual implementation plan. So that means creating a schedule of when these should be implemented, starting with December and then going forward 
from there? What are things that we can do right now? What are things longer term? And as part of that, that also means identifying what resources are needed, what are the metrics to determine whether or not any of those are effective, and then step-by-step -step breakdowns of how to implement any of the things. And that includes for social media. A lot of people, you, know, you guys came up with a lot of different social media recommendations. Cool. So uh, Tim had mentioned, what's the personality that Walling Fair should have behind the LinkedIn profile? Well, it's more than just the personality. The personality is the key thing. And then how often does that person post? Or, how, or does that personality post? What is the content that should be done and whatnot? And basically creating an ongoing template recommendation for what sort of content should be brought up. For the website, um, let me hit this, Callum, I see that you need to leave. So here's the things that I recommend. Come up with the draft revised layout and offer a more, so you guys give us the high level recommendation for SEO, give us the, the practical impl implementation of the SEO. What specific steps does Wallingford need to do? And then start to create the new content. So for example, you mentioned the researching the most commonly asked and search questions and develop answers to them. So I think Callum and Samantha, if you guys could tackle that and then any other recommendations you had, pull them all together and give us a draft website for the next time with new content and everything. And then um, again, what sort of things should we be looking for? Give us a process or a, a uh, experience flow, the UX of the website. Chandler? And Callum and Samantha, it's going to be and justifications for making the change. All right, so it's, yep. build, up, build that website. So you've got some visions now. This is what you believe it needs to look like and why. Because now we've got to take it up the chain and say, we're going to deviate from what was just done six months ago or within the last yeah, within the last six months. We're going to change it, but it's not just ours to change. All right, yep. so we've got to go in and tell them why we want to change it. So include yep. justification. Um, and Chandler, I think that you need to meet up with Sam and Callum because they have, um, they need to know what is the business process. And so as part of the consolidation of information, depending on Sam, if you, you guys are like, Hey, we need to have a page dedicated to how do you bring your business here or something. They need to know what the process is. But to that extent, once you give them all that information, you, my friend, have a big challenge. You have to go on two different fronts. The first is, yeah, I think software would be absolutely awesome and would help the system. So you need to make a recommendation of which of the ones you think is best. And that's going to be from a time and cost and resource approach. But also, how would it be implemented? What's the, how easy is it to transition? Is there training that needs to be done? who all needs to be involved. So from that perspective, yes. The second perspective though is looking at the entire process and how do we streamline the existing process even if no software is put into place? Or if software is put into place, how do we still keep it streamlined? Because um, this reminds me of when I was at NASA and there were a couple of times I worked on, we called it Kaizen. It was, yeah, that, that's a loose, <laughs> we were following a loose definition of it, but it was taking processes, mapping out every single step in the process, which you're already going down, but every single person who has to sign off, every single person who a paper gets handed to them or email gets sent to them, mapping out literally everything and then trying to pull away as much of that as you can because it's unnecessary. It, things can be done simultaneously rather than in sequence and stuff like that. So to the extent possible, we need to streamline it. One of the people you might want to talk to is Todd Langston, who is the owner of the Wallingford Chick-fil-A because he is all about streamlining processes and he's been doing it again and again and again with his Chick-fil-A, but that mentality would work perfect for this larger process. So those are all the next steps that I see. 
let me turn this back to our committee. Is that a good comprehensive approach or did I miss anything? I don't, I think, I think it does, but let me just go through it, David. And, and, sure. Um, Cause I was making notes throughout the morning, but I guess in my mind I'm saying, all right, we, we have, we are in a position now to build our message. All right. So build our messaging. And then to me, it's, it's prioritizing the messages. So we've got plenty of messages from, you know, all of our resources, from location, from mm -hmm. STEM community, but we've got all those, all those resources, all those assets. So now we've got a message and we've got to prioritize. So in my mind, it would say, you know, let's walk before we run. So let's, let's, let's get our feet wet somehow. So that's, that's one, that's one thing in my mind. The, the other thing is, is message delivery. All right. So we need to better understand the social media. Uh, social media is going to be the message delivery. We're going to use that to drive traffic to the website, which is going to take and, and enhance the experience, right? So that's, that's uh -huh. coming to get to my mind. Um, um, audience still saying, okay, so I'm still unclear as to how we build that LinkedIn. I mean, Again, I've got I've got an account. Do we do we just jump on that and run with that? I'm okay with that if that's what you guys say is the best way to do it. I don't know what the best way to do it is, but looking for your guidance there. Um, and so we've got to build an audience of site selectors, brokers, and we've got to be specific about business categories as far as who we're trying to attract. All right. Um, and then uh, what else do they have here? Um, and then resources. I like I like to. You know, we're, we're a limited resource department, okay? So mm -hmm. uh, we have two people, neither one of us work full time. So um, what, what kind of resources is it gonna take to take and make sure that we can continually have the messaging because frequency has not been discussed yet. So I need to know. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to limit the message based on resource. I want you to come up with the best way to message and then tell me the resources necessary to do it, okay? So I don't want to be limited by resource because if we need to add resource, then it's up to this committee to go to the mayor and say we need more resource. We need, we need another person. We need, you know, that, that type of thing. And in my mind, I'm still it's like, okay, we're still we're weaving, right? So we're weaving all this stuff together. How do we get started? When do we get started? Someone tell me. Someone give me a date. Are we up and doing something on a, on a limited basis so we can we're tipping our toe in the water. By middle of December, um, I mean, at some point, first quarter. Whatever. Yeah, I want to. I want to get going. We know that. We know that there's there's a lot of disruption in the market right now because of COVID, which could lend to some great opportunities for us. And every week that goes by, and I'm not pressuring you. I'm just saying, every week that goes by, I say to myself, did we miss another opportunity this week because we are not out there messaging what we're messaging? So in the real world. Taylor, you mentioned earlier, time is money. We all know that. To me, time is opportunity. So we need, we need to uh, you know, uh -huh. time on this thing. So implementation plan for the timeline, that's what I need to say. Or we need to say. That makes sense, David? Yeah, I, that is exactly. It sounds like you and I are on the same page on everything. So um, what I will do is I will take my implementation notes. I will flesh them out a little bit more so that it's in coherent speak as opposed to Dave speak. And I will send that out to the entire team. And then we will meet on the 30th and should have everything ready to go. 30th, 8 o'clock. Yep. Sounds like a plan. Before we adjourn the meeting, anything else to come up? Any thoughts? David, can you hang back in the call for one minute? I will be more than happy to. Yep. All Thanks, right. guys. Appreciate it. Very See you over weeks. Very impressive. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. <laughs> you know, this this uh, remote worked out okay. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. 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 wasn't so bad. Hey, David, uh, we are to the point now where um, on our, I want to talk about paying these kids, so, or the students. So um, we did, we said we we're going to do two-month increments, and we started in October, so. That's correct. 
um, we, I owed them some money, right? That's the that's the time we talked about. So we still haven't. I don't know that we, we concluded as to how we're going to do that. Yes, I was actually just thinking about that this morning because I was like, oh yeah, we never actually solved the problem. So <laughs> there's there's a couple of different ways. One of the easiest is I can reach out to each of the students, say, hey, here, um, let me Venmo you the money directly and then all the money comes into me. I can show receipts of each transaction if that would work. The all, because um, that way you only have to process one payment to a person and then I can very easily get the information or get the money out to each of the different team members. I don't know if that would work for your system. Is Would that be okay? So I, I, what I need is an invoice. I need- a, I can an create invoice. an invoice. Okay, that so we do. You're, you're creating an invoice with what, Dave Tomczyk, consultant from the University or? Yeah. I don't want you to get back from taxes either, you know? <laughs> if it totally shows no, Yes. Well, but it, the money that comes in is immediately going out. So it should have no tax implications for me. I just because I can, it. yeah, because I will have the receipts showing, oh, I've paid this money out to the, the consulting, consult, right. extra consultants. And so therefore I subcontracted it out and made zero profit off of it. Okay. When you do yeah. the invoice, would you just have their names on the invoice? So yeah. it would go, you go to the one person, but it'd be for these consultants. So what I can do is I can itemize it and say, have seven different line items, $250 for each person. Exactly. And then that way there's one total that comes to me and then the $250 goes to each person and we call it good. It's transparent. Yep. So it makes sense. Um, yeah. I don't see any downside. Um, I'm just thinking the town system. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, what I need is an invoice that has, it should have the university's name on it. The complicated mark was that if, if I simply spoke the check to each of these kids, it, it, it goes from the bursar's office and comes off their student debt or their student Oh, yeah. And it just, they don't get the money. Right. So David and I discussed that earlier and said, well, how do we go about doing it? But I need an invoice of some sort. Um, I guess having an itemization of names on the invoice is not of any significance to the town. Um, well, you know, but you can confirm that before he develops the invoice. Right? Yeah. I, I talked yeah. to the business office already. So, so you think that? Yeah, the important thing is that we get a, um, so who's the check being made out to? David Tom. It will be made out to me with the, so the invoice will, will be for me and yeah. here's the items, which are the seven students. And then I will be then sending the money out to each of the students directly. Right. But the individual group check will be made out to Professor David Hunt. Correct. So make that very clear on the, uh, on the, on the invoice, right? Check yep. table two. Yep. Yeah. So it's really not an invoice from Point of Jack University. It's an invoice from Professor Tom. Right. Yep. These consult for consulting services. Um, I mean, could it be actually mentioned on this? Okay. Right. Yep. Sounds yeah. like a plan. Can you think of anything else? The other thing I just wanted to talk about was the schedule over the next couple of months. Okay. The kids, well, I, I don't think anybody's on campus over the jam. I think, you know. Correct. And campus, come Thanksgiving, all the students are going home and they will be staying home from that point on until the start of the next semester. Which is in early February, right? So we officially start the last week of January, but students will be moving onto campus over the span of two weeks. So yes. Okay. All right. So I just want to stress to the team that, that this initiative continues to go, even though they're out of school, so to speak. That's great. So, yeah. Um, so, so, the logistical consideration that I had relating to the schedule was so we would meet the, the 14th, but we'll meet the 30th. We can meet the 14th. That should not be a problem. The 28th, though, is falling in between Christmas and New Year's. And so that would be one that potentially could be a challenge. 
So we could push the 28th off to the 4th. I suspect that. Um, do you think it's realistic, David, that you know we actually have some messaging going uh, by mid-December? The so our classes end the eleventh. So having a meeting on the fourteenth, yes. Um, it, having stuff actually coming out, like messaging our our students, creating stuff and whatnot. Yeah, I think on the thirtieth we should have a we should have a clear, comprehensive plan of here's how to do everything. And then from there, it's you just saying yes or no to each of the recommendations. And we can start having them create stuff. If you want, we can do between the 30th and the 14th as a pilot time. So people develop, here's, here's a sample of what's our Instagram post we would do. Here's a sample of the types of articles that could be written. One. And so that way on the 14th is a review of all that content <clears throat> and then official launch on the 14th. Or if you want, we can start implementing as soon after the 30th as you want. I, I don't want it to be rushed. You know, totally. I, I want it to be as creative as possible. I want to be able to have, we want to be able to have something of content in front of us, but it, it, it shouldn't be rushed. I mean, you know, they're, they're yep. coming up with, when you give them time, they're coming up with some great ideas. And, yeah. And I think we're making some great progress, but let's not rush it. So the reason why I am, I am okay saying we can start implementing after the 30th is by that point, be, the, the task that I'm giving them for the next two weeks of laying out all the logistics and coming up with descriptions and sample uh, templates and whatnot, is going to do a lot of that work of what you're just talking about, where it's helping them to focus their minds and clearly think through all the things. So if they're talking about, hey, we're going to do this social media thing, how? What's the content that you're creating? How often should that content be posted? So that's going to get them into the right mental space. And then um, for my small business marketing class, I do a similar approach. After they come up with the recommendations, we switch. They, they deliver the recommendations to their client. And then we switch almost immediately to now start implementing. The implementation takes a bit of time to gear up, but it, the total transition time is fairly low. The key here is if you would like to see samples of their work before they actually launch it. So that way the 14th would be a review of draft work and then the launch happens after that. Or if you say, no, we want to move now and then we can say, as soon as content is ready, it can start being posted. Yeah, so it, either way is totally fine. Take some time, think about it. But if the more the the more cautious way on the fourteenth really is only a two week delay, so that's not bad at all. Yeah. I, um, all right. If you're more aggressive, we, I think this team can totally do it. But I'd, I'd love to get you know once once we uh, I, I guess I still need clarity on LinkedIn. So if we're going to use LinkedIn, um, if it's going to be my account, that's fine. How do I build more audience? Um, if I yep. say, hey, there's something in the paper today that we should we should talk about in LinkedIn, then who am I going to speak to about taking and formulating that message? I'm not just going to copy the story from the paper. Yep. Pop it in there, right? So, and so. that's why I I what I'm going to send out is going to very clearly spell out. So not only is, do you have the schedule of like, when should we start this, but also how often should things be posted? What's, what's the guidance on creating it? I have a former student who created a social media consulting company and he created a training document that very clearly says on Monday, here's the type of post on Tuesday. Here's the post here on Wednesday. So I'm going to include that in the document that, or in the email that I send out to the team to give them a sample of, here's the level of specificity that needs to be included as you break down all of the different, um, different approaches that you have proposed. So the goal is that anyone, we could pull in someone off the street and they should be able to read the guidance and say, I know what to do to implement it. 
So that way, anything that you have to implement, you will feel comfortable with that. And if someone from outside volunteer opportunities, pull in high school students, pull in other college students, or our team goes forward with it, it doesn't have to be, well, this was my idea, so I'm the only one who can implement it. It's, this may have been my idea, but anyone on our team can implement it. All right. And we will, at some point, be giving, you know, they, they will have the, the technical ability to post, but we also have to have the discipline to make sure that no one posts anything without authorization. And so there's, yep. a, there's a delicate balance. I have, I mean, this is a great team, so I have no issue with uh, that, that trust level. But understand that as, as um, stewards of the community, yes. you know, that message gets submarine is pretty darn quick. So That is very, very good point. All right, David. Great job as always. All set. Well, thank you very much. I sure appreciate your time, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Look, look forward to your notes. And stay safe. Yes, and both of you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye now.